Disruptors, the show about the people who are disrupting, creating, building a better future. Today, we've got somebody who's doing that with a weird mixture of art and science. Carson Bruns on the program. Carson, thanks for coming. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's good to be here. So I hear you're a tattoo guy that's trying to or thinks we're becoming cyborgs, and I wanted to just jump right into it. What is it? What's the story? Yeah, uh, basically, the story is that tattooing is a very ancient technique. It's a very ancient art form and method of inserting material in the skin permanently. And I have a kind of scientific background, and I'm always trying to think of ways that we can implement um, new technologies to improve the quality of human life. And... So if we think about what a tattoo is, just a bunch of tiny particles that permanently live in the skin, um, my idea and what we do in my lab is to try and reinvent those particles so that they can serve some purpose beyond just kind of changing the color of our skin. And what does that look like? What do smart tattoos look like? What's the, what's the future of smart tattoos? You know, I'm not sure if your question is what do they, you know, what do they literally look like in the skin or what are the types of technology that we can see coming forward? Let's I take think, it as both. Yeah, many times uh, what they actually look like in the skin, at least I envision, will be nothing. They'll be essentially invisible until you have some kind of problem or maybe they'll always be invisible and they'll just be protecting you. There could be... Um, options to make tattoos that are both beautiful and functional so there could be ways to make um, kind of high-tech or biomedical tattoos that look like a regular tattoo as well so they might look like regular tattoos or they might look like regular skin but then in, in terms of the uh, sort of future of these sort of new high-tech tattoos and what I think they can do basically I think they can help our skin function in all of the sort of normal domains that skin functions in. So if you, if you break skin down into what it really does, it's a really important organ, right? It's the boundary between our body and the environment. And so uh, the skin does a lot to A, protect us, um, B, regulate us, regulate things like our body temperature, and then C, sense things. So we can sense um, forces, for example, through our touch, um, temperature as well. Um, and, and I think tattoos can, um, can help our skin in all three of those domains, actually. And what we've been doing, me and others around the world who are in this kind of field of research, have mostly been focused on um, improving the sensing function of skin with tattoos. So we can make tattoos that, for example, change color if you have some kind of um, biomedical uh, pathology. Like, uh, for example, there was a group that uh, invented a tattoo that will get darker if it detects a certain type of, uh, of cancer, basically associated with um, hypercalcemia, too much calcium in your blood. Uh, so we can detect those, we can sense those types of things with tattoos in principle, uh, sort of changes in our body chemistry that might um, be a problem. But then we can also sense uh, external things that maybe we can't normally sense. So in my own lab, we developed a tattoo, for example, that senses UV light. So it'll change color only when it's exposed to ultraviolet light. That's the kind of the high energy light and sunshine that causes sunburn and increases our risk of skin cancer and stuff like that or changes in temperature, and we're, we're working on tattoos that can detect other types of um, external fields and forces as well. So that's the kind of um, sensing aspect of, of high-tech tattoos and what they can do for our skin. But then looking forward into the future, we haven't really even touched what tattoos can do potentially for our protection and for our regulatory uh, functions of skin. So for example, I believe in the future it'll be possible to design a tattoo that can actually make your skin stronger and protect it from uh, forces that would cause it to um, be damaged, cut, for example, or bruised or something like that. Especially um, in elderly people, the skin starts to get very, very weak and it um, 
they develop all kinds of lesions and stuff and it should be possible to develop tattoos that can um, actually kind of mitigate the risk of those types of complications in your skin. Like, like lacing Kevlar in a shirt kind of deal? So, yeah, exactly. Like a, t- like a Kevlar tattoo, sort of. A tattoo that can make your skin um, just much stronger. And then, and then the regulatory component of skin would be uh, things like body temperature or also, again, body chemistry. So, so I'm envisioning a tattoo, and we're actually already working on one, don't know how well it'll actually work yet, but um, a tattoo that will essentially help regulate the temperature of your skin. So if you step out into a very, very cold environment, the tattoo could help your skin stay warmer for longer. So delay the onset of um, hypothermia, for example. Or conversely, if you step out into a really, really hot environment, a tattoo that can kind of help your skin stay, stay cool for a little bit longer before you get way too hot so you could regulate things like temperature with a tattoo we hope and then also um, uh, you could imagine if there's some kind of um, if you if you have a chronic condition or something that requires medication you can imagine um, building tattoos that will slowly release say hormones or drugs in low dosages um, over long periods of time to kind of regulate people's people's biochemistry Why a tattoo? I feel like if we're going to that high of a tech threshold, so to speak, when does something stop becoming a tattoo and start becoming something more? (laughs) Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, it, it, it might not be appropriate to call them tattoos at that point, because a tattoo, as we understand it now, is definitely thought of as this decorative thing, this body modification that's mainly used to change just the appearance of our skin. So if we design something that looks like a tattoo, it's made of particles in the skin, but it's not designed to change the appearance, but rather the function of the skin. Is it still appropriate to call it a tattoo? I don't know. Maybe we should call it something else, but, but that technology is, yeah, is coming. coming you're, u- you're using nanotechnology, I would presume, something along those lines. What's the, what's the tech, what's the process behind what you guys are actually doing look like? Yeah, nanotechnology is this um, broad term that we use to describe the science and engineering of matter on very, very small scales. So the size scale, um, if you're doing nanotechnology, the dimensions of the matter that you're working with need to have, at least one of the dimensions needs to be on the nano scale, which is like one to 100 nanometers, which is very, very small. I mean, um, a single transistor in a computer, in a modern computer processor is, I think it's on the order of 10 to 15 nanometers. Um, So very, very small. I mean, we're we're talking thousands and thousands of times smaller even than the width of a single human hair. That's what nanotechnology is. And that's definitely the tool that we use in my lab to design um, these high-tech tattoos because that size scale, that sort of nano size scale overlaps with the size scale of um, a tattoo particle. So if you, if you look at a tattoo ink, you take a tattoo ink and you zoom way, way in on the particles that are in that tattoo ink, they're usually on a size scale of like 20 to 1,000 nanometers. So it's, it's kind of, again, there's sort of like an overlapping kind of Venn diagram of nanotechnology and tattoo particles. And so... Um, we use nanotechnology to engineer tiny particles that do things besides um, acting like pigments. But there actually are other ways that you could think about um, approaching this problem besides nanotechnology as well. And although we don't do that in my own lab, there are people working on it. And the other main approach that I can think of is um, referred to as synthetic biology. So that basically involves engineering our own cells or some sort of biological uh, engineering some kind of cells to express new functions by genetic manipulation and the uh, the study i mentioned earlier that demonstrated a tattoo that can detect um, cancer associated with um, hypercalcemia was a synthetic biology tattoo. It, was, it wasn't a nanotechnology tattoo. That 
um, study actually involved engineering skin cells to express more, to accumulate more melanin, which is the pigment that makes our skin darker, only when it detects these elevated levels of calcium in the bloodstream. So it's so not it's something, oh, go ahead. Biology, yeah. Yeah, so it's not something your lab does, but yet that is kind of the intersection, the future, so to speak. How do you work with other researchers in those fields? How do you think about the, the partnerships, the separation, the direction? Uh, I am happy to work with anybody and everybody who's interested in uh, developing new technologies, new, new skin implantable technologies. And I think it's actually really important to have um, a vast diversity of ideas and expertise and approaches in this area because it's a really interdisciplinary uh, field that's kind of just emerging and it's it doesn't seem to me like the kind of um, like solving these problems are going to require a sort of narrow uh, focus types of thinking it's going to re require like diverse teams of people with um, diverse skill sets and diverse ideas. So I definitely try to interact with um, biologists and uh, even all sorts of engineers and chemists and material scientists so that we can kind of all converge on this problem. I don't think anybody can do it in isolation. How do you think about the privacy aspect? So let's say my skin turns red when I get XYZ condition. Super helpful because I can figure it out, but everyone else is figuring that out too. How do, you think, <laughs> how do you think about physical tattoos versus like an AR deal? I've got some type of augmented reality, contacts, lenses, glasses, or just something sending me a ping. Hey Matt, guess what? The baby has a temperature or you just developed, I don't know, gonorrhea or something. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. We, you know, I haven't, spent a ton of time thinking about the privacy issues, but um, certainly there are parts of your body that uh, where you have skin that could be tattooed that are still very private. So, um, you know, if, if there's a tattoo that's giving you information that you don't want to be public to anybody who can see you on the street, maybe it's wiser to just place that tattoo in a location that's always covered by clothes. Um, but you, you raise that sort of um, the AR technology. And I, I do want to say that I don't think tattoos are going to replace or be better than those types of technologies. I mean, I think in the future, we are going to um, draw from all these different emerging technologies to, um, to sort of give us a fuller picture of our, of our health in real time. So a nanotech scientist focused on tattoos. There has to be a story here. What got you involved, interested in tattoos? <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I got my first tattoo when I was 19 years old. I was in college and I had just returned from my first trip overseas. I took this trip to Japan and I spent like three weeks uh, kind of wandering around the mountains with a group of people studying Buddhism and we visited all these monasteries and learned a lot about meditation and chanting and it was like this really eye-opening and meaningful experience to me um, not only because it opened me up to so many new ideas but also um, uh, new cultures and new people and so it was just it was just this very meaningful experience to me and when I came back I wanted to commemorate that experience I wanted to some way to kind of remember it forever and so I got a tattoo I wound up getting a tattoo of um, the Japanese and also Chinese character for mountain on my ankle and um, I really liked the tattoo it, you know it was this kind of, kind of had, had a lot of personal and sentimental value to me for many years and um, a thing happened to me that I think happens to a lot of tattoo um, enthusiasts is after you get the first one you want another one right you get a reward it feels good you like it you want to do it again so I got another one and I liked that tattoo and got another one the tattoos kind of um, 
started escalating both in terms of their size and complexity and colorfulness and also kind of the levels of like nerdy esotericism that I was folding into them. They got increasingly nerdy and uh, kind of complicated. So I just, I've just, I've been on this path of continually um, enjoying the art of tattooing more and more. And that's just sort of for, for most of my life, that's just been kind of a thing that I'm doing in my personal life. A lot of people have hobbies. Um, I have an art hobby and tattoo kind of became a part of that. And alongside of that, I was uh, a researcher, right? I've been doing a lot of work in universities, nanotechnology work in universities. And historically, I've worked a lot on uh, molecular machines. So I've been trying to build nano machines, basically like the tiniest machines known to humankind. And uh, I kind of reached this transition period in my life where I was done with the kind of my training phase as a scientist, and it was time to move on to kind of leading a team and starting my own lab at a university. And um, I joined this really cool uh, research institute at the University of Colorado called the Atlas Institute. I'm still here. And the Atlas Institute has this really um, interdisciplinary uh, kind of ethos where we're trying to bring scientists and artists and engineers and humanitarians and all types of really diverse different kinds of thinkers under one roof and see how our interactions can lead to emergent and sort of synergistic creative technologies. And so when I was thinking about how I wanted to start my new lab here at the Atlas Institute, how could I sort of draw on my sort of skill set as a nanotechnologist, but also my passions and my interests as an artist? And it dawned on me pretty quickly that tattooing as a technology hasn't really been updated very much over the course of the thousands and thousands of years that it's existed. And so that seemed like a really cool space to move into. And at that time, I didn't know that there were other people in the world uh, working on kind of high tech tattoos at the same time. But I found out over the last year or two that there are a few other people kind of scattered around who are working on similar ideas. And I think a, a community is starting to form here, which is really exciting. So molecular machinery, you were building the smallest of small robots, so to speak. How does one even go about doing that? And what can a molecular machine even do? Yeah, well, molecular machines are, in a sense, they're everywhere because they are the workhorses of biology. So every cell in your body is chock full of molecular machines basically and the reason i say that is because if we think about what a machine is all it is is it's an object that uses energy to perform some kind of useful task and so inside of our cells um, there's all of these proteins that have all of these tasks they have to do and there's they use um, a, a chemical energy source called atp to kind of fuel all of these tasks that they have to do to maintain the healthy state of the cell. And these are really, really tiny molecules um, kind of on the nano scale. And so this, this idea of using nanotechnology to design molecular machines is very much inspired by biology, by what we see going on in our own cells. And just like biology, we build nano machines using atoms and bonds, essentially using molecules. So instead of um, what we do on the macro scale, where we try to build machines by machining things, right? By taking um, bulk materials and kind of chopping them up and uh, reforming them and bending them and whatever, doing things with our hands and with other machines. When things are this small, they're so tiny that you can't kind of manipulate them from the top down in that way. So you have to sort of design the chemistry so that they build themselves in a way. It's actually really, um, it's really cool. You, you sort of have to totally rethink, like the physics of um, nano machines is completely different than the physics of big everyday machines that we see just all around us. So it's this process of kind of forgetting the way machines work in the real world and the way machines are built in the real world and trying to 
discover how um, they're built on this kind of nano, on this molecular and atomic scale. And in theory, as we get closer to that, we could more or less replace almost all of what we do. Where are we at in terms of the tech right now, the industry, the development, and when will we start moving towards a phase where that is actually something that is doable, sustainable, et cetera. I want a hamburger, I create a nanotech hamburger from the ground up. I want a <laughs> desk, I create it from the ground up. Yeah, I, I have a lot of trouble predicting like the time scales that we're gonna see these things that we imagine um, actually becoming real. But what I do have a lot of faith in is that it will happen. Um, we humans just seem to have this incredible capacity to once, once we imagine something, as long as it doesn't defy the laws of physics, as we know them, eventually we're able to accomplish it. So, you know, the, the 3d printed hamburger uh, that you just kind of mentioned, I think is, it will happen but I have, I have no idea when. And it, it's definitely true that the molecular machines field is still very much in its infancy. So we can build molecular machines, we can get them to perform simple tasks, but um, we're nowhere near the sort of dream of um, kind of making anything that we want from anything that we want, you know, without, uh, for, for cheaply and, and quickly. So. So that's, that's a long ways away. I don't want to say how far away, but we're nowhere close to that. The types of things we can do with molecular machines right now are like simple, simple tasks. So we can build molecular machines, for example, that act like gates. They can kind of open and close the entrance to some kind of nano door. So one thing that's been one very promising kind of application in molecular machines right now is in controlled drug delivery. So for example, if you think about cancer and you think about chemotherapy and cancer, the reason people undergoing chemotherapy get very sick and lose all of their hair is because we're giving them these really toxic drugs to try and kill their cancer cells. But these are really toxic drugs, so they're also killing a lot of the normal cells as well. And so the way to avoid all of these really dangerous and harmful side effects in chemotherapy is to um, deliver the drugs only to the cancer cells. So to, to, to devise some way that the, the drug that we want to kill cancer with doesn't make it to any of our healthy cells. And so we can actually design molecular machines that will act as like gatekeepers and they'll only, you can, you can decorate the surface of say a particle, like a, a little container, a little nano container for cancer drugs with molecular machines that will only open if they detect a certain signal associated with cancer. So, and this has already been demonstrated in a few pilot studies that you can um, sort of present the body with um, these containers decorated with molecular machines and containing cancer drugs and they will by and large only release those cancer drugs when they see a real cancer cell and not when they see a normal human cell. So that's one really good example of where uh, molecular machines could serve um, a real purpose in the future. Another one is actually in computing. So um, the semiconductor industry is facing the end of Moore's law, which is that law that, um, you know, this sort of density and uh, the density of transistors on a chip is increasing exponentially while the price is kind of staying the same. So you can get every two years, I think it was, you could kind of double your transistor um, density for the same price. That law is finally coming to an end because um, manufacturers are coming up against sort of the physical limits. Like you just can't get uh, silicon based transistors any smaller. I mean, you can, but not much smaller than like 10 nanometers. But molecular machines can be as small as one nanometer or maybe even smaller. So if we can um, replace, if we can use molecular machines as sort of computing elements, that could be a way to radically miniaturize um, computing devices even further and kind of continue Moore's law. Would that be biological computing? I'm, I'm not talking about biological computing. I'm talking about, yeah, just synthetic molecular 
machines. Um, although I know that biological computing is a uh, is also a growing field, and I'm not very aware of what they're doing there. But yeah, there could be a lot of promise, and and molecular machines may be involved in in that field as well. Yeah, it's interesting. You're dealing with just synthetic versus biological molecular machines. So. 19 year old decides to go to Japan for a meditation retreat type deal and explore the mountains. What was going through your head at this point? When I was 19, I was, um, I was just exploring my, uh, I was exploring my interests. I, I was already, um, really interested in science and I had a, I had a chemistry, you know, I was majoring in chemistry. I, I wound up sticking with chemistry and getting all my degrees in chemistry. I never lost that love, but I, I was at a liberal arts school and they gave me a chance to um, explore lots of disciplines beyond chemistry, which I've always really appreciated. And so I, I was on this trip in Japan as part of a part of my education. Actually, I was taking a class on Buddhism. Um, and so I wound up um, being sort of so moved by that trip and the sort of experience of um, contemplation like contemplative practice that I decided to major also in religion so I was kind of I guess when I was 19 and running around the mountains of Japan I was thinking a lot about like what do I want to do you know what do I want to study what do I want to learn about what do I want to do with my life and that particular trip motivated me to dive a lot more into uh, philosophy and religion alongside my science education what was the most transformative moment or thing on the trip? Yeah. There was a, there was a section of the trip kind of about two thirds of the way through the trip where we did a, we went to a monastery and we stayed with some monks that um, were kind of relatively strict in, in the way that, uh, guests were allowed to um, interact and be and be in their space. And so it, it was kind of a, with the exception of morning chants at six in the morning, it was a totally silent uh, couple of days. And um, that was probably the most transformative experience because I'd never, I'd never been presented with an opportunity to just be quiet and to, to just contemplate for, you know, really long periods of time. And I know people do silent retreats that are a lot longer than a couple of days, but I think that was the most transformative because it gave me a lot of time to think and just be with my, to be with myself and to, um, yeah, sort through a lot of my, my own thought processes and my own motivations and interests. What was the takeaway? what did you come out with? Well, the takeaway was that I wanted to, keep studying um, contemplative practice and that I wanted to um, learn a lot more about philosophy and kind of, yeah, diversify myself into a person who's not, to not cast myself as just a scientist, but as a person who's just like interested in thoughts and ideas much more broadly. So the big takeaway was really, uh, it was, it was, it was kind of an identity thing. Before that I was, I thought of myself as a scientist and that's all I was. And when I left that trip, I was, I was more than a scientist. I was a philosopher and an artist as well. So is that one of the problems with science today? You have scientists just being scientists. They don't have that other, that second philosophy or type of thing that allows them to have perspective. You know, I don't want to criticize any, any scientists who think that they're only scientists. I, I don't think there's anything necessarily wrong with that. Um, I do think that um, diversity is one of the key ingredients for creativity. And so I think um, any scientist uh, has stands a chance to benefit from doing things that are not scientists, that are not science, that is. I think um, you can foster creativity by um, allow exposing yourself to other domains of thought and practice. 
Yeah, I would say it's very important, especially today where you have scientists creating the future, but not necessarily, or even at all, thinking about the, the potential consequences. I imagine the philosophy and Buddhism background that you have is helpful there. Um, yeah, I hope so. <laughs> are you still Buddhist today or are you Buddhist? What do you have any type of framework? Um, yeah, I don't identify as a Buddhist or any, I don't identify specifically with any religion, but I, um, I believe I, I practice meditation and yoga. And I think that those are valuable practices. Why are they valuable for you? What do you get? Uh, well, the meditation is valuable for, I think, kind of um, just my sort of general mood and uh, my sort of sense of well-being and calmness. Um, sometimes it, I, I might even be able to argue that, it's, it, that meditation also fosters creativity. I have sort of um, had some really fun ideas and kind of crossed my mind during meditation. Um, but I think the main benefit there is just, it, it just makes me feel a little bit better. I mean, it just makes me feel maybe, you know, 10 to 20% better when I'm regularly meditating. And then the yoga is, is also, it's for, it's kind of a cont contemplative practice as well, but it's got this physical component to it that I think um, helps me feel not only mentally better, but also physically better. What are the biggest challenges you have as a scientist and how do you decide whether or not to go the commercialization route? The biggest challenge as a scientist for me so far has been um, kind of navigating the space of like getting the appropriate resources to do the work that I want to do. So, you know, in the academic system, the kind of tra traditional way of getting support for our research is to ask the government for money. So most of our research in the university setting comes from tax dollars essentially. And there's all these different government organizations that um, give grants to researchers like me. Navigating that space, like arguing for why it's important to do the research that we're doing and that it's more important that, uh, you know, that the scarce that the scarce resources that the government has to support research go to me versus somebody else who's doing really um, awesome and important work is challenging. It's it's challenging to actually um, get those funds. There's kind of this like uh, situation in in research right now where the the pot of resources available to resources has stayed the same, roughly the same for the past decade or so, but the amount of people asking for those resources increases every year. So it's getting increasingly competitive and challenging to, to get support for your research. And that's always been, um, that's been hard for me so far, but we're also, you know, you, the other part of your question was about the commercialization route and that um, actually could be a really nice way to uh, kind of complement the traditional funding mechanisms that academic researchers like me use to support their research. So um, one of the tattoo technologies that we're working on that I can't really talk about too much yet, um, we do hope to start a crowdfunding campaign and maybe even commercialize eventually. And we hope that if that's successful, that we'll be able to feed those funds into our research to keep the research going and, and generate more um, technologies that we hope will help will help people so I think although it's um, although that's the most challenging aspect of my job it's also kind of the most exciting because I, I think there's an opportunity here to um, kind of break convention with the way um, resources are traditionally obtained for academic research. We kind of have to because there's just not enough resources and we need to invest so much more into the future to build it better. Exactly, and I'm in kind of a pr privileged position where a lot of people, a lot of the public, a lot of the American public especially, really likes tattoos. And so there's a lot of 
um, there's a lot of people out there who would probably be willing to support tattoo research. And so I say that's a privilege because that means that, you know, we do have a better chance of having something like a crowdfunding campaign work for us. I feel um, almost sorry in a way for people who are doing the more fundamental, you know, the sort of like theoretical physicists who also need support for their research, but it's much hard, harder to argue why um, the average, why it matters to the average per It's harder for the average person, the average person in the American public to understand why that is important and why it affects them directly. Whereas the tattoo is a much more tangible thing. I like tattoos. I want a tattoo that can change color. I'll support that. Um, How do we fix that balance? Because the other stuff is also very important and it kind of is reflected in education as well. What do we, what do we focus on? What should right. we focus on? Yeah, how do we fix that balance? So I think that problem of there's fundamental research that's hard for lots of people to understand why it's important, even though it is. I think that's maybe one of the reasons we have the funding mechanisms the way they are, where um, researchers ask government agencies for um, funding, and those proposals are reviewed by experts who understand very well why that research may or may not be important. So I think those, those mechanisms are already in place and there's a lot more we could probably do, especially um, in education. So just educating uh, just sort of like K through 12 education, even emphasizing in that education how important this kind of fundamental research is maybe people who are educated with that culture grow up, and decide to, more of them decide to support fundamental research that they don't even personally understand why it's important just because they were educated and really convinced that it is important at an early stage. So I guess the answer to your question is those mechanisms are kind of already in place, but there are ways we can improve. The obvious one to me is education, but um, I'd love to see more um, inventive funding mechanisms get invented. It's not obvious to me how you do it, but um, it would be really cool to um, for there to be something, there's kind of like government, private organizations, um, businesses, and crowdfunding. Those are kind of the four uh, sources that I can think of to support research and maybe um, Venture capital. It doesn't have to be limited to four. Yeah, maybe there are other types of organizations that could emerge to, to help address this problem. What technology or trend outside of your own work and field are you most excited about and why? <laughs> I'm, I'm most excited and also most scared about the same thing. And it's probably, uh, it's probably a standard response. I'm guessing other people on your show, if you've asked them that question, have answered similarly. It's the kind of... Um, it's like the rise of, of AI and general artificial intelligence. You know, you might expect me as a nanotechnologist to say that I'm really excited about, um, I don't know, nano robots or something. But uh, for some reason, I'm always gravitating towards stuff that's like further away from my own field. So um, the, the artificial intelligence thing excites me a lot because uh, for one thing, it should help us to automate a lot of a lot of things that um, people are doing that aren't fun and aren't challenging and aren't creative. Um, so, you know, if we if we can get to a point where machines are doing all of the kind of grunt work that humans that many humans are still doing, um, you know, cleaning bathrooms and picking up trash and I don't know a lot of it's going to start, I think, with a lot of those sort of mundane types of tasks that if those become automated, then all of this brain power and creativity of the humans that were previously doing those tasks is now free to do something more creative and more important. So, so that's why it's really exciting to me. But it's also really scary to me because, um, you know, the rate at which artificial intelligence is improving is almost exponential from from what I've read again I'm not an expert in this field 
But if that's true, then um, of course it, it's not unreasonable to believe that um, artificial intelligence will at some point surpass human intelligence. And we just don't know what that means. I don't want to say that it's going to cause a catastrophe, but definitely it would have to, it would, I would assume it would have to lead to a major like restructuring of our society, our government, our economy and everything. And so there's, there could be some serious um, growing pains as that whole uh, scene unfolds. So it's both very exciting and very scary. The other reason it's, it's exciting is because it could directly benefit my research, right? Like if, um, if I have a artificially intelligent assistance to help me um, carry out the research. So to, you know, we have to make these tattoo inks, right? We have to make the particles that we put in the tattoo inks. We could have machines that help us do that all the way up to brainstorming and figuring out, you know, the smartest and best things to do next. So the um, artificial intelligence could not only improve the quality of life, but even sort of the pace of research and technological progress. Yeah, it's the ultimate double-edged sword. It just yeah. depends which way it swings. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know how we could argue that AI is anything less than a black swan or an event horizon because you can't really predict what happens post. Exactly. I, I definitely have spent some time reading people's predictions and <laughs> the best I can do is, uh, um, you know, be amused by all that stuff. I, I think everybody agrees that we don't really know, but it's definitely exciting. It's what do you think about the future of wearables and how it intersects with what you're working on? What makes sense to wear? What makes sense to embed? Yeah, I, I'm really excited about the future of wearables. And I think that there's going to be, I think wearables and implantables are going to interact, right? I think in, a, in, a, in an ideal scenario, so, so the advantage of implantables is of course that they're much more permanent right the, the drawback of wearables will always be that they are they're temporary they're um you know unless they, you got to iterate the software how do you iterate software internally um i'm not quite sure i understand so for instance let's say fitbit launches a new feature i can get a new fitbit but if XYZ tattoo company that's awesome launches a new feature. Do I need to get that re implanted or am I able to in some way update? Do you think that there'll be a way to do that with the, the software, so to speak, of molecular ma ma machinery? Oh, that's an, yeah, that's an interesting uh, question. Too. Yeah, lean, lean startup. So, um, and that kind of comes down to tattoo removal, right? Tattoo removal is uh, a horrible process right now where. If you have a tattoo and you want to get it removed, um, they basically blast your skin with really high energy laser pulses that cause the tattoo pigment particles to break into tiny and tiny pieces that can then be cleared by um, sort of your immune system. So that's not a good way to, like in the situation where tattoo company XYZ invents a new tattoo technology that's better than the one you already have implanted, what do we do? Can we update it? Or do we have to give you a new tattoo? Do we have to remove the existing tattoo? Somebody needs to uh, like de develop more efficient ways to implant and remove tattoo particles, period. I think, you know, the way we install them and the way we remove them are both very, very painful, slow, um, inefficient. So, Somebody needs to solve that problem for this for the sort of like software update type of or firmware hardware update thing to really make a lot of sense in the implantable world. But um, what I meant by temporary for uh, wearables is that you know you get a Fitbit. Okay, it's 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 not necessarily you can keep the Fitbit. It's not necessarily temporary. It's gonna you know it's not gonna just decompose all of a sudden or spontaneously combust or something, but it, it's temporary on your, as part of, it's not a permanent part of your body, right? You have to wear it outside of your body. It creates these physical points of contact that make it necessary for you to remove at some point. You can't wear your Fitbit just forever or your skin underneath will start to get very uncomfortable. It'll start to um, 
it'll actually start to die some of it. And so it's like wearables have this inherent limitation that we have to take them off at some point. Um, and there's actually a lot of temporary tattoos that are um, doing a lot of the things that we'd like to do with permanent tattoos. So implantables have, don't have that problem that wearables have. They're definitely permanent, but they have other problems like the installation problem, right? It's much more, you, you, you might require surgery for an implantable device. Uh, it's more dangerous and costly and still potentially uncomfortable after you've had the implant. So both wearables and implants, I'm talking about like large scale implants are pretty uncomfortable and they have these drawbacks. I see tattoos as kind of having the advantages of both. They're, um, they're permanent like implants, but they're uh, kind of comfortable and easy, wear, relatively easy to install like wearables. Um, so, but there's definitely, you know, things. So the question when you're looking at tattoos and implantables are, are like, what are the things I can monitor or that I want to monitor? Um, and I have the ability to monitor over long periods of time. If there's, if there's something that you only need to monitor for a short period of time, a wearable is a much um, smarter choice right absolutely you want a tattoo if a tattoo is going to be with you forever it should be doing something that's useful forever too and so i guess that's kind of the criterion we're we're kind of looking at and so that's why for example the uv sensitive tattoo that detects your kind of uv exposure that's something that builds over your whole life you know the more the more uv um radiation that you're exposed to the higher your risk of skin cancer and the more rapidly your skin ages. So that's a really good example of something we want to know about our exposure for our whole life. Makes um, sense. So it works. But if you just, um, I don't know if you just have a cold. So we also made a temperature sensing tattoo. Um, and I, I, you know, I said that could be a way to measure your body temperature. Well, there's a lot of, good ways to measure your body temperature and most of the time you're not sick so the, the temperature sensing tattoo might be a little less useful it might actually make a lot more sense to have a wearable to monitor your body temperature than a tattoo for example yeah. it's a lot of sense it's you got to decide what you're optimizing for i got one last question for you i think carson before we start to wrap things up and let you get back to making incredible tattoos and changing the world and that would be if you had one thing to share with people, a quote, a call to action, it could be anything, before you tell them where to find you and a little bit more about the lab, what would it be and why? Uh, it would be to, sorry, I'm having an audio feedback situation. Uh, yeah, my one advice for, my one piece of advice for people would be to always, think about always can keep love in your heart when you're doing whatever it is that you're doing. Try to try to do what you love and try to ask if what you're doing is in service of love. I think our life is too short to do things that we don't enjoy, don't love, or to do things that are not in service of love. So that would be my one sort of uh, wish is that we all, um, pay more attention to love in our lives. I like that. It's unconventional, but incredibly important. Is there a, is there a sci-fi book or movie you think the world most reflects or we're most moving, most moving towards? <laughs> um, I don't know. I actually, I haven't even read uh, because I'm a, a tattoo tech person. I, uh, I w I'm inclined to answer in the form of a book where everybody has a futuristic tattoo. And I've heard there's a book called The Diamond Age where people have Mediatronic tattoos um, that kind of do the types of things that we want our tattoos to do. So maybe I'll say that book, even though I haven't actually read it yet. That's on my list. <laughs> yeah, you gotta read it. They probably have some good ideas. The, the sci-fi authors are always good about that. <laughs> yeah. Where can people find you, learn more about you, your work, what you do? Uh, yeah. I have a, you, they can follow me on my website. I have a website, just my name, carsonbruns.com. 
And then my lab also has a website. You can check out what my lab is doing on our, our my lab is named the Emergent Nanomaterials Lab. So you can check us out on emergentnanomaterials.com. And then I'm also uh, on Instagram. I post my art on Instagram, uh, Carson Bruns. What's it like being an artist and a scientist? It's super fun. Uh, you know, I get to, especially now that I've taken up tattooing as both an art and a science, uh, there, it's really fun to have them converge on each other and to be able to, you know, tattoo myself with my own technology. That's been just a blast. I love it. So terrifying tattooing yourself. Uh, no, it's actually less scary to tattoo. You, you know how you can't, um, you know how you can't tickle yourself. Like if somebody else tickles you, it, you can't control yourself, but if you try to tickle yourself, it doesn't work. I feel like tattooing is kind of like that. Like when somebody else is tattooing me, it feels a lot scarier and more painful than when I'm tattooing myself. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. I really wonder why that tickle thing is. I've never looked into it, but you're, you're very right there. <laughs> well, thanks for coming on today. Thanks for giving us an awesome, entertaining look into the future, Carson. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. And if you guys have enjoyed this, if you've got a tattoo or if you just want to be awesome, share this around with someone that you know, you love, or you think would enjoy the episode, disruptors.fm, and leave us a review on iTunes, disruptors.fm slash iTunes. It helps us rank higher, get more incredible guests like Carson, and keep this sustainable and running for you guys. So thanks, and thanks, Carson. Thank you. Sweet. Cheers. <laughs>